Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to show you the main points you need to consider when sizing appliances for each of your customers' sites. In order to do so, we always need to check the latest data sheet that you'll find on our website. Hopping on the data sheet itself, somewhere down the middle, you'll get to this page um, called Physical Edge Specifications. So you'll get each of the edge models that we currently sell and a lot of information about each of them. What I'm interested in here are mainly two things. The throughput and how we define the throughput. Well, the throughput is the sum of all the circuits, both uh, upload and download. Uh, so let's say I have a uh, edge here. And I have two links. One of them has 100 meg up, 100 meg down, and the other one has 50 and 50. You basically have to sum them up. So we have 300 out of this. So all of a sudden, you actually realize that, you know, looking at the 510 and 520 will actually not give you enough speed to fully utilize the circuits. You need to look at uh, uh, the six series onwards. It is very hard to know for sure what uh, throughput you'll get out of each boxes. And the reason uh, for that is uh, each customer is different. Some use a lot of applications that generate uh, a lot of small but frequent packets. Uh, some mostly use um, applications that utilize large but infrequent packets. Um, and some just do a bit of each. And because of that, we um, run these tests in the lab um, depending on a packet size. So you'll see that the smaller the packets and the more frequent they are, the more the box has to work to uh, in order to process them. So you will get less throughput. I usually like the IMIX number because um, this kind of gives you a ballpark view um, of um, the box handling uh, mix of traffic flows. Second important thing that uh, we should be mindful of is the maximum tunnel scale. This is the amount of tunnels that an edge can build with its remote peers via the overlays. So though that might be other hubs, other branches, and also uh, the cloud gateways. I'm gonna draw a, a small diagram uh, just to clarify a few things uh, about tunnels, uh, just to make it easy for uh, you to understand how to uh, sum them up. Um, and also I'm gonna be telling you what happens in case you uh, reach this number. Besides these two main points, uh, you might also uh, need to be aware of the maximum number of routes. Um, this probably uh, is important to large deployments with a lot of hubs. Rule of thumb here is that Anytime you're trying to advertise some routes from the data center, don't advertise each route individually, right? Just advertise a summary via BGP. And this means that the branch will actually have summary routes as opposed to loads and loads of subnets. And if you um, already know how many flows uh, in average that site has, uh, you might be able to pull this information from the existing router or even make some sort of ballpark calculation. You can also check this uh, max concurrent flows. So now let's go to the whiteboard uh, so I can show you exactly how you calculate uh, the maximum number of tunnels. So here we are at the whiteboard. Really easy example. We have um, two edges that try to communicate with one another. Uh, we also have a, a cloud gateway. So let's try to compute how many tunnels with uh, will this edge here have. The easiest example would be when we just have the one circuit connecting them because now there is just only one way we can create the overlay. So at the moment we have one tunnel. If we introduce the second link on a site, second uh, internet link that is, the edge will automatically create a second circuit. 
And if we mirror this on the remote side, then now we have four different paths to traverse between the local edge and the remote edge. And here you start to understand why the hub and spoke uh, VPN topology is preferred, right? Because the branch edges being smaller support a far lower number of tunnels than the hubs here. So if uh, I have each branch trying to do full mesh with everything else, uh, all of a sudden you either uh, run out of tunnel capacity or uh, you need to pay a lot of money to have massive boxes at each site. A few things to consider here. First of all, tunnels to the gateways count, right? So I have these two links and this might be, for example, my primary gateway. Guess what? I have two tunnels through here as well. So now all of a sudden I have six tunnels. Now the question is, okay, let's say I have reached the total number of tunnels that the box supports. What will happen? What will happen if I introduce another hub? What will happen if I introduce another site, etc.? And the answer here is when the box has reached the maximum number of tunnels, dynamic site-to-site -site tunnels do not establish anymore. So now if I have another branch here and I'm using either the, the hub or the gateway to trombone traffic, if the edge doesn't have any more tunnel capacity, it will not establish the dynamic site-to-site -site tunnel, right? It will always use whatever method you have configured as either the hub or the gateway. We will still be building tunnels to hubs. So if you introduce another hub here, these are permanent tunnels and the edge will establish them even if it reached the maximum capacity. And this is to give it a chance to, to talk with the rest of the state. This is highly not recommended. And the reason being is that the more tunnels the edge supports, so the more it has to process. And you should expect degraded performance if your static tunnels between the edge and the hubs or between the edge and the gateways are over the maximum limit that we state in the data sheet. Another thing to consider is what happens when we start to introduce private connectivity, right? So I might go and get myself uh, an MPLS line, MPLS number one, you'll see soon why, why I numbered it like this. I can name my edges here. The edges will create another overlay. We call that the user defined overlay, not the auto. The auto one goes across the internet. Right? So when we say that the overlay is user defined, the boxes themselves, they try to connect directly via the private IP address and not the public one. So if you go back to our calculation, we have four tunnels here, we have one tunnel here and we have two tunnels here. And the example can go on. There are certain customers who might have two different MPLS providers. So we have here MPLS number two, we bring it up. And now we have the eighth overlay that's being built. And this is where the private network name comes in. You might have seen it in different demos and wondered why do you actually need the name for private networks? Well, this actually allows the box to understand that these two interfaces, although both private, they go through two different separate networks because if it doesn't, then it will assume that this network is one and it will try to establish tunnels from this interface all the way to that one, right? And this is something that's not possible in this example because the MPLS networks are actually separated. So although we don't really build a tunnel and you don't need to count it, still the box spends time and processing power in trying to, um, in trying to connect to the other side. So our recommendation is if you have multiple MPLS providers, give them two different names so the boxes know that there's a difference between them. 